Okay. Good morning, everybody. So we are continuing. Uh, we're on Daf Gimel. Um, Daf Gimel Ahmed Aleph. Daf Gimel Ahmed Aleph towards the bottom. So we started discussing yesterday. So we saw like this, just a brief recap. We had four explanations, which we went through, of our Mishnah regarding the Beit Sa, regarding the Machloket, Beit Shammai and Beit Hila, regarding the Beit Ashna Dabi Yom Tov. Which Beit Shammai says says Te'achel, Beit Hila says Lo Te'achel. So according to Rav, Rav Nachman, this is all a case of Muktza. It was a question of a Beit Sa, of a Tanegol et Ha'menet Legadel Beit Sihim. And according to Beit Hila, we're concerned for Muktza. According to Beit Shammai, we're not concerned for Muktza. The problem with Rav Nachman's approach was, why does the Mishnah just talk about the Beit Sa and not talk about the Tanegol? So that was number one. Number two was Rabba. Rabba said, no, we're talking, we're dealing with a Tanegol et Ha'menet Achila. And seemingly, Seemingly, once we reject Rav Nachman, all the Amorayim agree that the case in the Mishnah is a Tanagolet Haomedet La'achila, which is which is going to be eaten. But what's the issue? The issue is that the egg is uh, was completed on Shabbat. We, we're dealing with Yom Tov that comes after Shabbat, and therefore you had Hachana on Shabbat for Yom Tov, and that makes it a problem that's going to be an Isur. That's the only case. That's the case according to Rabbah, which would be an Isur Doraita. And as a result of that, Chazal made a decree that on any Yom Tov or on any Shabbos, the Zeg is going to be forbidden as well because of Hachana. The other Amoraim did not accept Rabbah's opinion because not everybody holds the, this principle of Hachana. Not everybody holds you need Hachana. Okay. Then we saw Rav Yosef. Rav Yosef says that this is all a Gzera of Perot HaNoshrim. Perot HaNoshrim, that in the same way that you have fruit which falls from a tree, you aren't allowed to, uh, to use it on Yom Tov because we're worried you might go up and then uh, detach more fruit from the tree. So too, the egg is similar to that. Rav Yitzchak says, no, it's a gzera because of mashkin shazavu. Oh, they're there. Okay, so this is... A similar, similar gzera that we have over there, whereby we say that if you have fruits, which you aren't allowed to squeeze on Yom Tov to get the juice out, but if, uh, um, if the juice comes out by itself, so then also there, we say you aren't allowed to benefit from it, you aren't allowed to use it, because you might come to squeeze the fruit. So same thing, that the egg is similar to Mashkin Shazabu. And we saw why did Rav Yosef and Rav Yitzchak argue with each other. We said, what do you? what is the right analogy? How do you compare the egg? Do you compare it to Perot and Oshrim, because this is fruit and that's fruit? Or do you compare it to Mashkin Shazavu because this is concealed and that's concealed? Okay, so those are the four opinions. And we saw the Gemara explain why the four opinions are... Uh, are, are opposed to one another. And then we saw that Rabbi Yochanan also seemingly holds like the final opinion. The way we know that, we infer it from a stira which Rabbi Yochanan brought in, in Rabbi Yehuda's opinion. Rabbi Yochanan brought the stira and he solved the stira. But the only way to understand it is if he understood that the whole issue with with um, with, with the Beit Sash, not Rabbi Yom Tov, is because of Mashkin Shazav. So that's what we started looking at yesterday towards the end. I'm going to go back now and see that again. And then we'll see after Rabbi Yochanan's stira. So he gave his answer, but there are other Amoraim who are going to give a different answer as well to solve the stira in Rabbi Yudah. So, let, so, so let's see it again. Tafkima and Aleph, we are, I guess, halfway down the Amud, we, where it says, um, Right, about halfway down the Amud. Rabbi Yochanan also held that we're dealing here with a Gzera, because of Mashkin Shazavu, how do we know that? To Rabbi Yochanan, Rami, to Rabbi Yudah, to Rabbi Yudah, Umeshani. Rabbi Yochanan uh, raises a contradiction in the words of Rabbi Yudah, the Tana, from the following two places, and he solves the contradiction as follows. So first was Tanan. Ein sochtin et haperot lo tzimen mashkin, vim yatsu me'atzman asurin. We don't squeeze fruits. Again, we're dealing with Shabbat or Yom Tov. This is Mishnah Masechet Shabbat. We don't squeeze fruits to get the extracted juices from them. The but and if they came out by themselves, the juice that's still going to be forbidden. That is the gzera of Mashkin Shazav. Rabbi Yehuda Omer im lochlin hayotzem min mutav im Mashkin hayotzem min asul. So Rabbi Yochanan makes a sorry. Rabbi Yehuda makes a distinction. He says no, that gzera would only apply. If the fruits were, if the fruits were there for juice, but if the fruits were there to be eaten, so the juice that comes out of them by itself is going to be uh, is going to be permitted. So Alma, 
Amma kol ochli and Rabbi Yudah ochli the ifratu. So we infer from that that Rabbi Yudah holds that when you have food and food that comes out, the juice in this case is food, and it's food that's separated from food, and therefore that is going to be that is going to be permitted. So that was the first Mishnah. Now the contradiction comes. Raminu ve'od amar Rabbi Yehuda matne adam akalkala shel perot be'yom tov lishon ve'ochla b'sheni. So this is the case where the case here it's dealing with Rosh Hashanah, where you have a basket of fruits that is tevel. You've not separated trumot and masrot that cannot be done now on Yom Tov, but you forgot to. So he says you make a condition, you do it all tonight, right? On the first day, you say, if today is Chol and tomorrow's Kodesh, again, we treat both days, practically speaking, as Kodesh, but inherently, intrinsically, one of them is actually Chol. So we say, if today is Chol and tomorrow is Kodesh, then I'm separating the Tremont and Masrot now. And if today is Kodesh and tomorrow is Chol, then I'm not doing anything. But And then the second day, you make the same condition. And on the second day, you can now eat the fruit because Miman of Shach, the the Trumot and Masrot has now been designated. So he says, "But now, Adam al Kalkalash Abaru beyom tov lishon vochla b'sheni. V'chein beitza shenoda b'lishon teachel b'sheni." Says Rabbi Yehuda, "So too, an egg which is which is laid on the first day of Rosh Hashanah can be eaten on the second day." But sheni, and, and 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 again, the logic is the same because if the first day is the day of your uh, of Chol, well, there was never any problem with the egg in the first place. If the first day is the day of Kodesh, well, then on the first day it would be forbidden, but on the second day you could eat it. That's fine. And um, so this only works on the second day. It does not work on the first day. So okay. So what is the so what so what is the contradiction? The contradiction is as follows: in the first Mishnah. In the first Mishnah, we learned that Rabbi Yudha said, if the fruits were there for the sake of food, then the juice that comes out of them is, is food as well. And therefore, it's uchla de'efrat. It's food that's been separated, and it's permitted on that day, on Yom Tov. So if that's the case, if we say that the egg is similar to uh, the juice that comes out of fruits, it's all a case of mashkin shezavu. Well, Rabbi Yudha holds that when you're dealing with food, we're not worried about mashkin shezavu. It's all food. It's uchla de'efrat. So you should therefore say that the beitza shenoda would be permitted even on the first day, even on Yom Tov. Right? Again, if the reasoning over here, if we were going according to the logic of, say, Rabbah, we're talking about Hachanah de Rabbah, none of that would apply. But it's only if we understand that Rabbi Yuda holds, the way that Rabbi Yochanan understands, that Rabbi Yuda holds that what's the problem with an egg which is laid? It's a problem of mashkin shezavu. It's similar to that. But Rabbi Yehuda himself has... So, so this is how we know that Rabbi Yochanan holds by Mashkin Shazaf. But, but according to Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda himself taught us that when we're dealing with food, we're not worried about that uh, about that issue. That's what we learned from the first Mishnah. So the fact that Rabbi, that Rabbi Yehuda then says, that, it's, that this egg is forbidden on the first day, it makes no sense. It makes no sense why Rabbi Yudha would say that the Beit is is, uh, is is forbidden according to Rabbi Yochanan's understanding. That's the stira. That's the stira that, that Rabbi Yochanan uh, uh, raises. So we learn from that, incidentally, that Rabbi Yochanan holds that the whole issue with this egg is, is Mashkin Shazavu. You're comparing Rabbi Yudha's opinion in one Mishnah where he talks about Mashkin Shazavu and in one Mishnah where he talks about Beit Shnoda and you're saying it's a stira can only be a stira if the reasoning is similar for uh, uh, in, in both cases. So, answers, answers Rabbi Yochanan, uh, he says, how do, we, how do we resolve the contradiction? Umeshani, three lines, two lines from the bottom, Meshani Rabbi Yochanan, Mukhlefet Ashita, Mukhlefet Ashita. In other words, Rabbi Yochanan says, no, we have to switch it around. Why was this a contradiction? Because in the first Mishnah we saw, we saw Machloket Tanakama and Rabbi Yudah. The Machloket Tanakama and Rabbi Yudah was that according to the Tanakama, the Mashkin Shazavu, the fruits, the juice which comes out of these fruits, are never permitted. And according to Rabbi Yudah, he was the one who said that uh, if the fruit was uh, for the sake of food, then the juice is permitted as that's food as well. 
So says Rabbi Yochanan, no, it, it must be a mistake. Mukhlef Tashita. Tanakama is the one who makes the distinction between whether it's Lamachal or Lamishteh. And Rabbi Yuda says, no, it's always forbidden. So if Rabbi Yudah says it's always forbidden, then it makes sense that Rabbi Yudah says about the egg that it's forbidden on the first day of Yom Tov as well. So that's Rabbi Yochanan's answer. He says, uh, right, I have a look at Rashi, four lines from the bottom. He says, Meshani Rabbi Yochanan, Mokhalefet Ashita, Shitata Mishnah, the En Sochtin, the first Mishnah we quoted about not squeezing the fruits. The Ipoch, the Rabbi Yudah, the Rabbanan. Switch around Rabbi Yudah and Rabbanan in that Mishnah. So, 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 that's what Rabbi Yochanan brings. Now the Gemara just proves, explains how this entire how this entire sugya is meant to prove Rabbi Yochanan's view in our Mishnah. It says now, uh, since you, Rabbi Yochanan, brought these two Mishnayot as a contradiction, one to the other, we understand from that that there is one that there is one uh, reason behind them. One reason behind both of them, that is both connected to Mashkin Shezafu, both regarding the fruit and regarding the Beitza. Um, okay, so that, is, so that is the contradiction. And that is Rabbi, as I said, that's Rabbi Yochanan's answer, is that you have to switch around the opinion of Rabbi Yuda and Rabbanan in the Mishnah. We now have another two different answers how to address this stira. So now the top of Amud Gimel, Ravina Amar, so, so, so Ravina says no. He says you don't have to switch it around. Really, it's as we said before. The opinion of Rabbanan is the opinion of Rabbanan. The opinion of Rabbi Yuda is, uh, is is correct, as we explained previously. But in the second, in the second uh, Mishnah, why is it not a contradiction? Because Rabbi Yuda is not giving his own opinion. Rabbi Yuda is saying l'shitatchem. He's saying, according to you, according to your opinion, Rabbanan, I'm going to say this. Uh, in other words, what, what does that mean? So, so what he's saying to them is like this. In other words, he's saying like this. We're now dealing with the second Mishnah, the one where you have this basket of, uh, basket of fruit, right? Uh, or and 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 we said that you make the the condition on one day, and so too it's going to be the same case with the egg which is laid. So Rabbi Yudah says like this. He says, "Ledidi, afilu barishon nami sharia." He says, "Regarding the egg which is laid, according to me, according to my opinion, as we've learned, we said efrat." So I would say that it's permitted even on the first day of Yom Tov, the uchla efratu. But according to you, according to your opinion, Chachamim, but you don't hold by Uchlad Efrat, you say that the egg that's laid is going to be a problem. So at least, he says, You should at least admit to me what? In other words, you should admit that uh, even according to your opinion, it's going to be a surah on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, you have, to, you have to accept that it's going to be permitted on the second day. So again, this relates to a side issue. This relates to a tangential argument, which we're going to see a little bit later on, which is when it comes to Rosh Hashanah, do we say that the two days of Rosh Hashanah are considered one Kedusha or they're considered two Kedusha? Every other Yom Tov, Yom Tov Sheni Shal Galiot, we say that it's considered Shtei Kedushot because the only reason why we have two days of Galiot is because at least initially it started off as a Safek. One day was was uh, was Kodesh and one day was Chol we weren't sure which. When it comes to Rosh Hashanah, as we'll learn later on, by, by Rosh Hashanah there was a separate takana, separate decree, that even at a very early stage, when it, there was no safek, and it was known which day was meant to be Rosh Hashanah and which was not, nonetheless, there was a zera that you would have two days. So the two days, do we relate to them as one kedusha or two kedusha? So Rabbi Yudha, yeah, was just trying to prove the point in the context of that sugya to Rabbanan, saying, look, it's two kedusha, therefore you have to admit to me at least that on the second day, the egg is going to be the egg is going to be permitted. But what comes out of this? What comes out of this answer of Ravina is that according to Rabbi Yuda, the egg which is laid on Yom Tov is permitted on Yom Tov. Now wait a minute. That means that means that Rabbi Yuda holds. If we go back to our Mishnah, our Mishnah says explicitly an egg laid on Yom Tov according to Beit Hillel, it's it's forbidden. So does that mean Rabbi Yuda Paskins like Beit Shammai? This is very strange. So have a look at Tosfot. Tosfot says, yeah, Tosfot le Didi. 
So it says, let the afilu belisho nami shal, yeah? In other words, Rabbi Yudha is saying, for, for, for my opinion, at least on the first day, even on the first day, the egg is going to be, uh, it's going to be permitted. He says, but, says Tosfot Vatayma. It's very, very strange. Rabbi Yudha de Amar Kebet Shama. Rabbi Yudha is now saying, like the opinion of Beit Shama. The Chishavik Beit Hila, Vavit Kebet Shama. We know that we both can like Beit Hila, not Beit Shama. How can that be? Rabbi Yudha. V'yesh Loma. Says Tosfot. The Rabbi Yudha ya Omer. So our Mishnah, right, and we, we discussed already, Stam Mishnah, our Mishnah, the Tanakama, is not like the opinion of Rabbi Yudha. Whoever the author of our Mishnah, the way Rabbi arranged it, says that we have a machloka between Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai regarding a Beit Hillel, which is not Abba Yom Tov. Apparently, according to Rabbi Yudha, I know that's incorrect, Rabbi Yudha's tradition was that Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel did not uh, argue on this point. He checks the whole Mishnah out. He thinks that it's uh, that it's that it's going to be permitted. Okay, so that is that is uh, number t- explanation number two of the stira between the two Mishnah. Again, the stira in the opinion of Rabbi Yudha, that from the first Mishnah, it sounds like it sounds like he says that anytime you have food, even the liquid that comes out of the food, because it's considered food, it's food that's separated, it's permitted. But then in the second Mishnah, he says. That uh, that a beitzah uh, shenoda on Yom Tov on the first day it's going to be forbidden. The second day it's it's permitted. So so answer number one to the stira was Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan said no, we've actually got it the wrong way around. We switched the opinions in the Mishnah. Opi- answer number two was Ravina. Ravina says no, we don't switch the opinions around. But Rabbi Yehuda was talking the shitatam of Chachamim, but he himself holds that on the first day it's still going to be. Permitted. Let's just see Rashi. Rashi at the top of the of Kimon Amud Bet. Ravina Ama had a Kamar Rabbi Yochanan Muchlefta Shita Lo Tepo. In other words, when Rabbi Yochanan says, switch the opinions around, and in fact, do not switch the opinions around. He says, Uchla de Efratu. It's food which uh, separated. For Kevan de Mishum Shita Leika Mishum Ashkin Shazavu Nami Leika Beomenet Lachila. Right. Since by uh, since we say. In the first Mishnah, that uh, it's food which is separated, we don't say that there's a prohibition of of schita. Um, so, uh, so right, we don't say mashkin shazavu. Um, also, when it comes to the stanagolet, which is that which is to be eaten, we say it's food. We're not worried about the stanagolet of mashkin shazavu. Okay, so then he said, Rabbi, Rabbi Yura is speaking. He says, khu, according to your opinion, de asri tula. Af In other words, Rabbi Yudah is saying, Chachamim, you're saying that the egg is forbidden even on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. So he says, no. Af sheni, nami te'it lechu bebeitza, gzerat mashkin shezavu, v'afilu betan agolet ha'omedet la'achila. Even though you have, you, I don't hold that this gzerat uh, mashkin shezavu applies at all for a tan agolet ha'omedet la'achila. But you do. Nonetheless, Admit to me at least that on the second day it will be permissible. One of the days is considered intrinsically as as Um Right, sorry. And then the Gemara says, so what's what's how did Rabbanan answer back? So he said, says the Gemara now. So Rabbanan answer back to Rabbi Yuda, Lo. They say no, we consider it as Kedusha uh, Achat uh, Rosh Hashanah. So, so if the egg, we'll see this later on, a little bit further on, we'll see it in more detail. But therefore they say that if the egg was laid on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, it's forbidden on both days. Why? Because we relate to both days of Rosh Hashanah as Yom Richter, as one, one Kedusha. Says Rashi, Kedusha Achati, V'lodamu l'shal yamim tovim. This is unlike other festivals. This is unlike other Yamim Tovim. Because this, this Rosh Hashanah was not established because of a Safek. We've discussed this in the past in the context of Rosh Hashanah. But um, even in the time of the Beitin, even in the time of the Sanhedrin, they would, they would uh, still perform two days of Rosh Hashanah. But the Mishnah towards the end of Masech Rosh Hashanah explains that if the Edim came late in the day after a certain point when there was a, it happened before they got the Shir Shayom wrong right so if the, they made a Takana they said if the Edim are only going to come 
if they come after Mincha, so by the by the time of Mincha, uh, Mincha Ktana, we've established that the following day will be judged as Rosh Hashanah. But if, then if the Adim come and you know actually today is the day of uh, the day of Rosh Chodesh, doesn't matter. You still treat the next day as as Kodesh as well. And that's why we have Kedush Shachat. By the way, this gets a bit co- it gets a bit complicated because we relate to Rosh Hashanah as Kedush Achat, but we relate to it as Kedush Achat Lechumra and not Lekul. Meaning, we are machmir to say that since it's all one long day, therefore, if the Beitzah was Noda on the, at the beginning of Rosh Hashanah on the first day, it's going to be forbidden on the second day as well. So you might think if you relate to it as Kedush Achat, you relate to all of Rosh Hashanah as one long day. So then you could prepare from the first day to the second day, because it's really all, all one long day. But we don't say that. We say in that direction, we say L'Chumrah as well. So we say L'Chumrah both, both ways. We consider it as Kedusha Achat L'Chumrah and not, 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 not L'Kula. Okay. So that is the second explanation for the stira in Rabbi Yuda, as was pointed out by, by Rabbi Yochanan. Third explanation. Third, third answer. We are now about six lines down from the top. Ravina Braid Rav Ula. So we saw we saw a Rabbi Yochanan, we saw Ravina, now it's Ravina Braid Rav Ula. He says, He says, there's no stira why, because over there we're dealing with, we're not dealing with a Tanagolet, We said if it's a Tanagolet, it's going to be eaten, so then it's all Khadefrat, it's food which separates from food. But here in this case, over there, not unlike in our Mishnah. In, uh, in 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 that, in that Mishnah, which talks about uh, the two days of Rosh Hashanah, we're dealing with the Tanagolet, which is designated for laying eggs, and therefore it's not, the the chicken itself we don't consider as food because it's there for laying eggs. And Rabbi Yudah letame to eat le mukta. And Rabbi Yudah, remember, we said at the very beginning we have this machloket about whether we say mukta, we don't say mukta, whether we are we uh, are more stringent about the different. Um, Different types of mukta or not. Rabbi Yudai is the one who is stringent about it. So Rabbi Yudai let me to eat le mukta. So he says, uh, um, he says over there that this would be a problem of mukta, and therefore it's no stira because it's got nothing to do with mashkin shezavu. It's just got to do with mukta. It's a different type of chicken. Says Rashi, Ravina bray davol ama. Rabbi Yudai, Rabbi Yudai meikara lo tikshe. He says the uh, contradiction. From the words of Rabbi Yudai, in one place to another, it doesn't even begin. It doesn't stop. There where he said that the egg is forbidden on the, uh, permitted on the second day, not the first day. That's uh, talking about a chicken that's there for laying eggs. It's got to do with mukta, and it's got nothing to do, it's got nothing to do with, uh, with, with uh, mashkin shazab. Okay. Now it says the Gemara as follows. Meitivay, we have now a challenge. Uh, right, this is going to be a challenge on some of the some of the reasons that we've explained now regarding again regarding the uh, we had four explanations of our Mishnah. Um, Rashi says Rashi says via Meitivay Ahanach Amorai Kamai the Ifluk Betama de Betila de Vanitian. So this is the first two explanations that we had regarding the 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 Isur of Betila on our Mishnah that it's got to do with again that it's got to do with Muktza. So it says like this. Echad Betza Shnoda be Shabbat. Vechad Betza Shinoda be Yomtov. Ain metal tilinota. Lola Hasot by Takli. Vlolis Moch by Kila Mita. Aval Kofea la Takli Bishwil Shlot Shaver. So we say like this. If you have an egg which is laid either on Shabbat or on Yom Tov, right? No distinction between those two cases. We say like this. We don't carry it. We don't carry this egg. So you can't uh, carry for any of these uses. Aval You can you can put a kli on top of it in order so that it won't uh, so that it won't break to, to safeguard it. The sveka asura and as if you have a, a safek that is going to be forbidden. In other words, sveka. What do we mean? It says Rashi sveka shazo asura. 
Kasal Kadatach. So you would think it means at this point, the Gemara is going to explain what what, what does Sfeka mean. So at this point, we understand Kasal Kadatach, Safek Noda Biyomtov, Safek Pachol, Asura Biyomtov. We think it means Safek, that whether it was laid on Yomtov or on Chol, we're not sure. That's going to be Asur on, on uh, Yomtov. And then it says, the Imnit Avaba Elef, Kulan Asurov. And if this egg, particular egg gets mixed up with another thousand eggs or with many other eggs, they're all going to be forbidden. So we'll see why. So what's so what's the question? The question is like this. Bishlama le Rabba de Ama Mishumachana have a sveka de laita v sveka de laita lochum. Okay. What's our what's our question? Our question is going to be on the fact that you said sveka asura. You have a suffix which we understand at this point to mean, you have an egg which was laid, I don't know, I don't remember if this egg was laid on Yom Tov or it was laid before on Chol. So I say it's going to be a sort, it's going to be Muktzah. So if we say the reason why it's Muktzah in the first place, if it was Vadai, Nodaba Yom Tov, is because of Rabbah, as we've already mentioned many times, Rabbah's explanation is Hachanad Rabbah, that it's going to be so uh, an Isur Doraita. Right, and therefore, yeah, we have a suffix to write This would again, this would seemingly only apply, therefore, on the if it's the case of Yom Tov, uh, which is after Shabbat, not just an ordinary Yom Tov, but 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 in any event, so it says, right? Rabbo says it's because of Achana, so your suffix is a Doraita suffix for call Sveka Doraita Lachumra. Anytime we have a suffix to write, we know we go Lachumra, we're stringent. According to Rav Yosef and Rav Yitzchak, who said, no, the whole reason it's, it's uh, if it's Vadai no Daba Yom Tov, the whole reason that it's uh, forbidden is because it's a Gzera, either of Mashkin Shazav or of Perot that in itself is already a Gzera. Now you're saying it's a Safek. So it's a Safek to Rabbanan. Because Safek to Rabbanan, Lekula, Right, any time that you have a safek drabanan, we are lenient. So why are you stringent in this case? So that doesn't make sense. So that's brought seemingly as a proof that Rav Yosef and Rav Yitzchak are, uh, are, are 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 incorrect. That the halacha should follow should follow Rabba. So answers the Gemara. No, it is safer. Atan safek trefa. Right, this is why Rashi said kasal kedatach. You think at this point that the safek relates to whether it's a safek of whether it was laid on Yom Tov. Says the Gemara, no, the safek is not in this case uh, whether it was laid on Yom Tov. The safek is related to whether it's a safek trefa or not. Um, right, say by atan safek trefa. The Gemara then questions why it would say if that's the case. Says Yehachi. Right, the, the next part of the of the uh, the next part of the mission is going to be difficult, where it says where it says that if it's uh, was um, why would it be that if it's that if it is uh, normally we say that that when you have a mixture in that kind of in that quantity that's going to be. That's going to be a uh, mutar. It's going to be batel be'elef, right? Why does it say safe in the davar be'elef kulan asulot? Yamata bishlama safek yom tov safek chol avay davar sheish lo matirin. I'll just read this and we'll stop. But we'll explain it more next week. But he says he says yamata bishlama safek yom tov safek chol avay davar sheish lo matirin. V'kol davar sheish lo matirin afilo be'elef lo batel. Ela ili yamata safek trefa davar sheish lo matirin ivetivatel beruba. In other words, it's like this. The last line of the Mishnah only makes sense of brighter. Excuse me. Only makes sense if I say that it's safek is regarding Yom Tov. Because if the safek is related to Yom Tov, so then we have a concept of what's called a Davar Sheesh Lo Matirin. Davar Sheesh Lo Matirin means it's something which is forbidden now, but at a certain time, it will become permitted. And since it will become permitted, then ordinary laws of Bittu will not apply to it. So then I understand. But if the case is that it's a safek trefa, it's not a Davar Sheesh Lo Matirin. And in that case, then Bittu should apply, and it should therefore be, and it should therefore be mutam. Okay, so that's going to be the discussion. We get into some very fundamental concepts and very fundamental ideas relating to Isur Ter and Taravot uh, and Kashrut as well. But our time is up for today, so that we'll have to wait for next week. Good day, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.